Now he's a big man and can sing. You know, I, I see how people have been developed over the years, and uh, it, is, it is something to marvel at. It is something to be uh, glad about. And I see, I see singers and musicians that are they're becoming more accomplished. I see people becoming more accomplished in their service to the Lord. I see people becoming more astute in their study of the Bible. And, uh, and we're supposed to be growing all the time. Isn't that right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and I'm excited and glad, fulfilled that God's doing things in people's lives. And so we ought not ever back off on praying for one another because we all need to come on up a little bit, don't we? You can be opening your Bibles to uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 24. By the way, uh, speaking of being developed, um, Brother Denny's preaching next Wednesday night, Denny Beard. And, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him. He always does a good job, and he's just, Brother Denny is one of the, oh, he's still in here. I was going to brag on him, but I see he's here now, so I'm not. <laughs> he, uh, man, he's come a long way since he's been here, too. The Lord, the Lord wants to bring us closer to him. And uh, Brother Jason and I were talking about that. You know, we just, and that's what we're doing here in the uh, book of Colossians, is talking about how to give Christ the preeminence how to grow closer to the Lord, make Him what He ought to be in our life. And, and when we make the Lord first in our life, He has a way of raising us up and, and getting closer to Him. And I want to be closer, don't you? Closer to the Lord. And so tonight we're going to be preaching on the subject of marvels of ministry. Marvels of ministry. The Reverend James Harris, age 77, of Oriana, Illinois, collapsed and died in the pulpit after he had just finished preaching a sermon, 77 years old, and with his last breath, as he fell to the floor behind the pulpit, after he had just finished a sermon, he said this, I have just one more point to make, and then I'll close. <laughs> and he closed. And uh, that last point might have been made in heaven. I don't know. But he, I think you could say of a man like him, the ministry lasted as long as he did in his life. His life proclaimed the gospel of Christ until he took his last breath. Somebody, a young preacher, asked uh, John Wesley, the famous preacher John Wesley, he asked him, uh, how can I get uh, people to attend my preaching services? And John Wesley said, just catch on fire and people will come to see you burn. <laughs> and... Uh, I think that's kind of what we're looking at here in uh, Colossians 1 uh, and verse... Actually, we're going to start in verse number 23 to get the context. In Colossians 1, 23, we see this in Paul's life. In verse number 23, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and was preached to every creature which is under heaven... Whereof, watch this phrase, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Verse 25, whereof I am made a minister. Hey, he just said it again. I am made a minister I am made a minister for you. And uh, let's see, I've lost my place here. I'm in, where was I, verse 24? 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. These verses talk about 
the ministry which Paul was involved in, and the ministry goes far beyond just one man. The ministry is what you and I are involved in. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray that you'd bless us tonight. May we be lifted up and encouraged by your words here. Lord, may we have a hope in this life of being able to fulfill your will through what you call the ministry. Help us, dear Lord, to fulfill that and to hear the words from you one day. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We love you now and we pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit that you would anoint our lips, anoint our ears, help us to see with eyes of faith tonight that which you have for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So we're talking about the preeminence of Christ in these passages of Scripture. All these, these chapters in, first, in, in Colossians are talking about the preeminence, lifting Christ up to a high level where He belongs far above everybody and everything else. The gospel ministry was what motivated and drove Paul. The ministry, it was in his heart and it pushed him forward. That's what he lived for. He lived to see people get saved. The ministry had difficulties for Paul, but it was so important to him to see people respond to the gospel. He actually said this in Romans chapter 9 verse 3. Listen to this carefully, would you? Paul said this. He said, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Wow. What a saying. I don't think I could say that. Well, I don't, if I was the Apostle Paul, I guess I could, but I'm not him. And that's a powerful statement. And that says he wanted to see those people be saved. He wanted them to come to Christ, and he was willing to, as much as he loved the Lord, he was willing to be accursed from Christ if that would mean they could get saved. And yet, he loved them and wanted to see them get saved. So he's here writing here to the church of Colossae. And notice in the first place, we're going to look at several things in, these, in this passage of Scripture that we just read. The first thing I want you to notice tonight is the making of the ministry. Verses 23, back in uh, chapter 1, verses 23 through 24, the making of the ministry. We see two facets mentioned in the making of the ministry. Now, now look, don't tune this out and say, well, this is just about the ministry. This is for guys that's, that's uh, preachers or evangelists or pastors or missionaries. And so it doesn't include me. Yeah, it includes you. <laughs> You're in this. And uh, the making of the ministry, as far as Paul was concerned, involved, number one, a call, a call to the ministry. In verse 23, the last part, look at this. He says, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Do you see that word made? That means that somebody else did the action. He was made a minister. It's not something he did to himself or for himself. God called him. God called the apostle Paul and made him a minister. He made him a minister. There is a call involved in the ministry. And so... When somebody is called, they're made a minister when they surrender. I remember <coughs> back in uh, the early 80s, a uh, little boy was with Brother Snethern and some of the other folks from our church in the camp, summer camp, and <coughs> Brian Ivey went forward. They were, they were having some hot preaching. I mean, man, a preacher was just shelling the corn, and people were coming down the aisle giving the invitation, and people were going down there, a lot of kids going down and getting saved, and kids surrendering to be missionaries, kids surrendering to be this or that, and, some surrendering to be preachers, and <clears throat> they'd bragged on the ones who were surrendering and stuff, and some of the other services. And so Brian Ivy came down the aisle during the invitation time. And so Brother Snethern went down to uh, kneel down beside of him and pray and see if he could be of help to him. And he said, Brian, can I pray with you about something? And Brian said, well, Pastor Snethern, I've decided that <clears throat> if I don't find any other job, I'm going to just be a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Snethern laughed about that over the years. If I can't find anything else to do, I'll be a preacher. <laughs> yeah. See, I think some, some people look at it that way. I think there's men in pulpits today who are preaching because they couldn't find anything else that appealed to them, so they said, well, I'll do this. Uh, thought about being a brain surgeon, but that didn't work out, so I'll be a pastor. <laughs> well, you know, 
It's not something being a minister, being called into the ministry is not something we do for ourselves. It's something that God calls us to do. And so Paul recognized the calling upon his life. And so there's the call and then there's something else that goes along with that in the making of the ministry is not just the call. We're talking about the fact that man's not in charge of uh, his destiny when it comes to this thing of being called to preach, it's something that needs to come from God. And uh, when I became aware of God's call on my life for the ministry, I tried, I tried very carefully to make sure that, that it was His voice I was hearing and not something I was suggesting to myself because, quite honestly, I, I didn't figure I was really preacher material. And uh, some of you are thinking the same thing, I know. <laughs> and think about me. And so... Uh, I wanted to be careful that I was not just inventing a call from my own heart and calling myself. And so I prayed and read the Bible and meditated. And I'd wake up in the morning and I'd, I'd, uh, the, the, words, uh, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And I got to thinking, you know, uh, Jonah didn't listen to the Lord the first time. And uh, he, got a, he ended up getting swallowed by big fish. Well, I'm, I like fish, but I'd rather be the one doing the swallowing. And so... Uh, I said, well, Lord, if you're calling me, I guess I better surrender. And so I tried to make sure that this was a call of God for sure. And this is not something that you just arrive at quickly and easily. And maybe it is for some people, but, but it wasn't for me. I struggled with it because I wanted to make sure that this was God's call and not mine. And so Paul is speaking about his call to the ministry. He was made a minister. Now, that's not to say that somebody... Uh, uh, who is not sensing God's call to the ministry for a full-time minister that, that is not good for them to preach in jail or to preach in their own church or to teach a Sunday school class or to preach in a nursing home ministry. That's not what we're saying at all. But if somebody's going to be a full-time minister, he's given his life, he's surrendered his life to be a minister, it ought not to be chosen like he would choose to be a carpenter. It's not just a... It's not just uh, an occupation that you'd pick up a list down at the employment office and say, uh, they don't need any sheetrockers, they don't need any truck drivers, they don't need any plumbers. Oh, here's one preacher. Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> it's not something that we just do on our own. But Paul said, I was made a minister. He answered the call. So there's a call to the ministry. And, and in verse 25, there we Let's read this. We'll see the charge of the ministry. In Colossians 1.25, the last part says, "Where?" well, I'll read the whole thing. Whereof I am made a minister uh, according to the dispensation of God. According to the dispensation of God. That dispensation, the word dispensation means stewardship. It's something that God gave to Paul and, and he's supposed to become a manager, an overseer, a steward of what God has entrusted to him. That's what dispensation means means in this context and uh, and he's be a disp it's a dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God you see the word fulfill that word's there for a reason <laughs> that's an important word fulfill not only is a as Paul saying I was made a minister I was called to be a, a minister of the gospel I was called to this position but then he said I've got to fulfill it in other words, you surrendered, now do it. That's what God wanted out of you. We don't surrender just to have a position or a title. We surrender to do the work, to get the job done, and to be what God called us to be. Uh, the word fulfill means to accomplish. And so we have to go further than just answering a call according to what Paul said about himself, but he was to fulfill what God called him to do. The ministry is not just a pastime or a hobby or an occasional thing for Paul. It was his life. It was his life. He would rather, he'd rather be in the ministry as to eat when he's hungry. You know, that's what it means. I've said this oftentimes in teaching in Bible college a few courses. I've told the young men, hey, if, if God has called you to preach, you better preach and fulfill that calling. If... Uh, if you wait until somebody's willing to pay you a big salary to preach, I doubt your calling. <laughs> if you're willing to go out and make a place, carve out a niche in the woods, and if you can't find anybody else, go preach on a street corner 
And, uh, and if a guy's just waiting until he gets a big salary to preach, then I, I ser- sincerely doubt that if he understands that call or else he doesn't have it. So the call to the ministry in the first place and the second is the uh, merriment that we see in the, Paul's ministry. In verse number 24, watch this. Go with me to verse 24. Who now, next word, rejoice in my sufferings. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> rejoice in sufferings? Did Paul say that? Yep, he said it. He said, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And so he says, I'm rejoicing right now. Rejoice now in my sufferings for you. He's rejoicing now and he's rejoicing in his sufferings. What does the now mean? Do you know where he was when he wrote this letter to the Colossians? He was a jailbird. (laughs) He locked up in the Mamertine prison. He's He's in Rome. And that's not a happy place to be. But look, here's what's important. He's in prison and yet he says, I'm rejoicing. I'm suffering, but I'm rejoicing. He was the kind of guy that knew how to have a good time in the Lord. Some people look like, boy, they've got a dose of it, but they wish they could get rid of it. (laughs) Some people look like they've been sucking on a pickle before they got saved and after. A dill pickle. And uh, if, hey, this goes for all, it's not just somebody that got called to preach if Paul a preacher could suffer in prison and still say I'm rejoicing then I wonder what that says to you and me would we be able to rejoice a little bit if times were not going real good rejoice this boy this is such an important point I wish I wish I had some kind of magic wand just to wave it and sprinkle uh scriptural dust all over you <laughs> and make you get this one because I think, I think there's a lot of people that really don't enjoy their Christianity but Paul knew how to enjoy it. Even in a stinking, rat-infested, muddy, dark dungeon he said, I rejoice in my sufferings. Things don't always go smooth. Sometimes things are just really rotten if you want to know the truth. Things could get rotten for Paul but he knew how to rejoice in the midst of it Paul enjoyed his ministry, obviously, with great pleasure. He enjoyed what he was doing. I've said this before, and I I don't have to make up a phrase or two to mean this. I mean it. I enjoy the ministry. I enjoy being your pastor. You may not enjoy having me, but I enjoy having you. (laughs) I enjoy what I do. I enjoy my own preaching. I mean, really. (laughs) Well, it's because I'm the only guy I know that I agree with 100%. (laughs) <laughs> that's the problem with other preachers I just don't agree with them see but I can agree with me I enjoy what I do and uh, the reason Paul could say I'm rejoicing is because he had it way down deep inside of his soul it wasn't something he was wearing on his shoulder like a chip F-O. some people can be joyful as long as everything's going their way boy let something get out of sorts just a little bit and man they've had it ready to quit church, ready to quit their marriage, ready to run their kids off, ready to move to Mexico, ready to do this or that, and uh, just ready to give it all up. Life's not a bowl of cherries. Sometimes life's just hard. And we all have it. (laughs) Nobody is exempt. We're either going to have health issues or money issues or or friend issues, or relationship issues. We're going to have something going on from time to time. And if you wait until everything's going smoothly to enjoy life, friends, you're going to die way before you wanted to. (laughs) Just got to learn to enjoy life. Because Paul said, I can be here in prison and still rejoice. That word rejoice comes from a a word that is translated from that means it carries the idea of a continuous joy ongoing, a continuous joy. Now, Zig Ziglar, I used to read, back when I was selling automobiles, I'd, my boss wanted me to read uh, See You at the Top by Zig Ziglar. He was a motivational speaker and writer, and, and Zig Ziglar uh, had a section in his book that was supposed to make you a better salesman because you had a, had a positive attitude, you know, and so I read the book, and I I remember this one place in his book. He said, he said I've, tr- I've made a habit out of this one thing so my day goes smoother. He said, when I wake up in the morning, he said, I sit straight up in the bed and clap my hands and say, oh, glory, it's a brand new day. 
I thought, he's an idiot. <laughs> I hadn't been able to get to that point yet, but I do enjoy life. And uh, I think anybody that has a good time before they drink a cup of coffee is just something's wrong with them. <laughs> Give me my coffee and then I'll have a better time. Nehemiah 8.10, you know this verse, the last part of it says, The joy of the Lord. Are you listening? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Friends, I can't tell you anything any more important tonight. If you're already saved, you've got the best thing going. You've got salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and you'll be a lot better church member. You'll be a lot better witness. You'll be a lot better parent. You'll be a better employee on the job. If you learn to have a good time and just enjoy life, learn to rejoice. Don't be a down and outer. A Christian can be a hab habitual complainer and whiner and a fault finder. You ever been around the fault finders? I mean, it doesn't matter how good things are going, they'll find something wrong to criticize. And some people, it's just a habitual way of life with them. Don't stay around those folks too long. I mean, try to lift them up while you're around them. Try to, instead of getting down in the dumps with them, make sure you get up and try to lift them up. And if they won't get up, leave them alone. <laughs> Go find somebody else that, that you can have a good time with. I'm not talking about sin, I'm just talking about People who have a good time and enjoy life. Joseph Haydn, the great musical composer, somebody had asked him uh, why his sacred compositions seemed to have such a glad, uh, glad ring to them. And he said, here's what he said. I'm going to quote it. He said, I cannot compose anything without it. I translate into music the very state of my heart. When I think of the grace of God... In Jesus Christ, my heart is so full of joy, the notes fairly dance and leap from my pen. Well, I'd like to have a dose of what he's got, wouldn't you? Hey, just practice on being joyful. Count your many blessings and name them one by one. Maybe we need to do that more often. We've got some things to be glad about, not just, just as uh, somebody said earlier, not just at Thanksgiving, but we ought to be able to be thankful all year round especially if you're saved. If you're not saved, then you probably ought to be sad, but you can get saved. David said in Psalm 16, 11, he said, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. <laughs> oh, God, give us some old-fashioned Christians who just hum and sing. That's what I loved about both of my grandmothers, I can just hear them walking through the old house. They just had an old run-down house. It wasn't worth nothing. The old house they lived in was ramshackle, the old houses. But they were just happy as they could be. And I can remember being there with my grandmothers, both of them, and they'd just be sweeping and sweeping the dust through the cracks in the floor. <laughs> and they'd just be humming. They'd be humming some old hymn. I, didn't, I was just a kid. I didn't know what it was. But they'd just be humming away. I mean, just humming. They'd think there was an old hen out there about ready to lay an egg or something. They'd just be humming and humming. I mean, you couldn't help but be happy when you listen to them. If you have trouble staying happy, try humming a little bit. My grandmother would like you better. <laughs> we can be dragged down by negativity and faithless people, but we should just try to lift them up and uh, get them up on a higher plane. Somebody's got to be the example. I don't want to be the example of the naysayer. I don't want to be the example of the faithless one. I don't want to be the example of the one that says, oh, woe is me. What's that little cartoon character? Uh, he was always walking around, had the little cloud over him. Uh, huh? No, Eeyore, was, uh, he was donkey though, wasn't he? This was a little boy, and he had a dark cloud that followed him everywhere. It just kind of rained on him wherever he went. Anybody remember that? No, I think this was in Peanuts. Well, there was somebody in Charlie Brown in that comic strip. But anyway, he, he, everywhere he went, he just had a dark cloud following him, and, uh, and he didn't have a good time. And uh, Eeyore didn't know. Oh, Eeyore, yeah, you're, you're right about him. He's going, oh, woe is me, you know. Oh, nothing ever good happens to me. And uh, somebody else inherited a bunch of money, but not me. <laughs> oh, my. Philippians 3.10 tells us why Paul could do this, because Paul... Wanted to be so close to Christ. He wanted to be close enough to Jesus that he was even willing to desire to share the sufferings of Christ. 
Now, that's tough to grab a hold of. You have to let your mind wrap itself around this thought just a little bit. Philippians 3.10 says, Paul said this, he said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Jesus was crucified and we're crucified with him. And if we're going to have a lasting joy, we have to learn to rejoice in the sufferings because it was not even out of reach of Christ. He endured the sufferings. And if we really want to know him, we'll have to know his sufferings too. Did you hear that? If we really want to know him, we'll have to know something about the fellowship of his sufferings. Number three, the malady of the ministry. We're still talking about elements of the ministry here that Paul's discussing. In verse number 24, uh, the last part, let me read the whole verse. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. I mean, he's, he's talking about the malady or the, the hurtfulness, the afflictions that go along with it. And we just talked about that some. And it's not suggesting here that Christ left something undone. That Christ wasn't behind in getting things done. His, his sacrifice on the cross did it all, friend. He didn't leave anything undone. But we're behind in our sufferings for him. And uh, if we catch up to his sufferings, then we experience more of him. Number four, the mystery of the ministry. He mentions this in verse number 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from the generations, but now is made manifest to the saints. A mystery is not something that can't be known. A mystery is just something that wasn't known, perhaps, to the Old Testament saints, but it was a mystery to them. However, it's been revealed in the New Testament that it's not a mystery to us. It's a mystery to them, not to us. The gospel of Jesus Christ was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen. Even Jesus' own disciples, the night before his crucifixion, when he said he's going to go to the cross and rise again the third day, they, they don't have anything to do with that. They thought, man, this can't be so. They didn't understand what the gospel was even then. And they did later. And the mystery that he talks about here is the mystery of the Gentiles and Jews being knit together in one church. This Colossian church was evidently a lot of Gentiles there. And Paul's saying, hey, it was a mystery. Back in the Old Testament, the Jews thought they had, had dibs on God. Nobody else going to get in, you know. And now in the New Testament, Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. And he says, now that was a mystery to the guys in the Old Testament that you guys, you Jews and Gentiles, are going to end up setting right across the aisle from each other in church. But that's the way it is. When you're in Christ, you're the same. And everything's level at the foot of the cross. So there's the mystery there. And then there's the methods of the ministry in verse number 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. <clears throat> you know it takes wisdom to be a good witness. If you're going to tell people how to be saved, it takes some wisdom. That's why we need to pray for the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives. When you got saved, listen, when you got saved, you knew this, but the Holy Spirit moved right into you. <coughs> and so you've got wisdom available. The Holy Spirit can give you that wisdom. In fact, in the book of James, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So you can have wisdom. But when we witness to people, I think a lot of, I think a lot of witnessing goes on in the flesh. And when we ought to be praying for God's wisdom. I don't think you can take a cookie cutter presentation and win everybody with that same presentation. I think you've got to take each person as an individual, find out what kind of questions is in their heart. Back, back years ago, I was trained by, by my mentors to, hey, you, you give them this Romans road or whatever we were using, you give them this verse, this verse, this verse, and this verse, and if they ask you a question, here was, the, here was the response we were supposed to give them. Hey, that's a good question. Let me finish what I'm giving you here from the Bible, and I'll come back and answer that for you later. Well, that sounded good at the time, you know. But what you're doing is just putting them off, and you're not answering their question, 
and you're trying to make a cookie cutter Christian out of them. Wait, if they if they really have a, a deep seated question in their heart, they need to have an answer, and we need to have the wisdom of God to know how to answer. I've seen, I've seen both extremes. Brother Joe and I were talking about this a little while ago. I've seen both extremes. I've seen one where you've got the, the little short presentation, ready to pray, ABC, pray after me. And then I've seen the other side where another guy wanted to quote the whole Bible before he'd let anybody get saved. He wanted to quote him from Genesis to Revelation. I mean, who's got time to sit and listen to the whole Bible? I mean, we need, there's got to be some common sense and some wisdom in there somewhere. And if they have questions... We ought to know enough of the Bible to find some answers. And if we don't know, the honest thing to do is say, I don't know, but I'll look it up and see if I can find it. <laughs> I'll go ask somebody that knows more than I do and see if they can help me, and I'll, I'll come back and try to answer it for you. But people need to have their questions answered, and it takes wisdom. That's what this verse is talking about, the wisdom, teaching. Well, let's read it again. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What was Paul's motive there? And that's, uh, that's my last point is the motive of the ministry. He wanted to present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, complete, mature, ready to meet the Lord. And why are we here at a midweek service anyway? Well, just so we can say, well, done my duty. No, we really ought to, we already have our heart in tune with the Word of God so that we can learn more of the scriptures and we can become mature. And, uh, and as I said earlier, I see, a lot of, I see a lot of people in here that have gained a lot of maturity in a lot of different areas. And that's what we're here for, is not just to increase our knowledge so we can beat somebody in a debate. <laughs> I mean, you can't argue anybody into heaven anyway. But we can mature as we learn more of the Word of God through the wisdom of God. And that's what Paul wanted to do is present every man perfect. That ought to be our desire to go out and win people to Christ, bring them to church, and let them be exposed to the teaching that will make them mature. It's called discipleship. I think we fall down, and I say we, Christianity across America, I think in general falls down on their job on the discipleship part busy trying to make converts sometimes without telling them what they're supposed to do after they get saved. And they wander off somewhere and we never see them again. And uh, I appreciate Dennis and Amanda bringing, uh, bringing Allie and Dustin to church with them. And that's, that's, that's what ought to happen, you know, is, is when, uh, when we contact people, whether we win them to the Lord or whether we discover them somewhere after they're already saved, if they're not church, we ought to try to get them in so they can learn how to please the Lord and become a mature person. And Paul said, then I, I'll be able to present them as a perfect man before the Lord one day. Everybody's going to stand before the Lord one day. We're in this thing together. All of us are in this together. I mean, there's, if anybody thinks that one person can reach the lost, get them baptized, get them discipled, and build a church. Any one person can do that by themselves. You're deceived. <laughs> it takes a team. It takes us working together to do it. I'll end with this little story. There was the, the safari hunter in Africa, who this was years ago, and uh, he he wanted to go elephant hunt, hunting, so he got uh, he got about 75 uh, natives from a tribe there to go with him to carry his gear and, and help him with any game that he might bag and stuff like that. And so he, he took them all with him out into the bush and he shot an elephant. And uh, when he got over to the elephant, uh, those natives were putting big ropes under the elephant, and picking him up, getting him ready to take him back to the village. And he said, what, what are you doing with those ropes? And they said, well, we're going to take our elephant back to the village. He said, our elephant, my foot. That's not our elephant, that's my elephant. They just dropped the ropes and they all started walking towards home. He said, wait a minute, where are you going? They said, we're going home. If it's your elephant, you take care of it. He said, wait a minute, guys. He said, you're right, it's our elephant. <laughs> you know what we're doing? It's, it's our elephant. If we're going to win people to Jesus Christ, get them discipled and present them before the Lord for what he wants them to be, we're in this together. 
we all need to carry a little piece of the elephant. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and let's pray.